next one, generic attributes, finally. So we were able to do attributes, custom attributes. You basically create a class that derives from the base class attribute. Uh, but if you want to do something with types within that attribute, you uh, needed to have properties of type type. Um, so in this case, we have a, a custom attribute that has a type property, and we can use um, some kind of type. And we do it like this. So custom, where the type equals the type of an integer, for example. Up until now, we were not able to do this in a generic way in C Sharp. So, but now, finally, we can do a generic custom attribute of T, which derives from an attribute, or in this case, the custom attribute. And I can use the type of T to set my type um, uh, property, which means that I can just do something like this, generic custom of int, which looks a lot more clean than it did before with the type of int. So again, another very small new feature um, coming to C Sharp 11. Next one, interpolated string holes. This sounds interesting. So we all know that interpolated strings is a thing these days, so we can have variables inside of our strings and they will automatically be interpolated. In C Sharp 11, you can actually have a block of code inside of an interpolated string, a block of code that can span multiple lines, which is very handy if you want to structure um, your C Sharp code instead of having, having it in one single line. So now you can, for this, in this case, for example, you can do the, the if statement like, if test equals true, then I'm going to use number one, else I'm going to use number two. And you can span that in different uh, multiple lines so it looks a little bit more clear. Um, this is a stupid, stupid example, but if you have a very complicated thing expression inside of your interpolated string, you can now split it into multiple lines and it will just compile without any issue. By the way, as much white space as you want. Um, another new thing, list patterns. So, in this case, I'm just going to write some, um, some arrays of values, arrays of integers, to the con console. Um, 1, 2, 10, 1, 2, 7, 3, 3, 10, and so on. Um, and I can do pattern matching, pattern matching on these arrays, where I can do a switch. I can do a switch, okay, I want to see what is my input array, and depending on what the array looks like, I can make some decisions. And this is also new where you can have, okay, my array needs to start with one and then two, then something else, even multiple values, and it needs to end with 10. And in that case, I'm going to return the value one, which means if you look at the arrays, the first array is a valid one, but the second is also valid because it starts with one and two and it ends in 10. And everything in between doesn't really matter. So this is pattern matching where you can just see okay, what applies to these rules. Very powerful. You can also do something like this, which means it's the discard operator in uh, C Sharp. So this already exists for a long time. If you want to discard something, you use the discard operator. In this case, it means the array needs to start with one and I'm just going to discard whatever is coming after. Uh, can be nothing, can be whatever. And this means everything that is remaining. So it doesn't really matter, it starts with something, it ends with something, it has nothing, doesn't matter, it's all the, the rest, but it needs to be an array. If you're going to start adding variables inside of your pattern matching for uh, lists, um, you can basically capture a slice of your array. So in this case, your, your array needs to start with one, then it needs to have something that you're going to store into the middle, and then it needs a final element, and it doesn't really matter what the final element is, and this piece of your array will be captured, and then you can reuse that piece of the array. So not the entire array, but only the piece in the middle. So if you run this, you can actually see that it works, hopefully. So from the top, you have these um, six arrays, and then in the bottom you can see that the, the middle is two for the first array. It's the first element needs to be one, and then the last element is discarded. So two is the remaining slice that is being captured. And then for the second array, the middle is two, seven, three, three. Same story here. So very um, powerful things that you can use to slice your arrays 
using pattern matching. Next one, raw string literals. This one is uh, quite interesting. So we all, we all did try to do something like this uh, in the past. We all tried to do some JSON inside of a, a multi-line string, uh, and we tried to do uh, interpolated strings with that. The problem with JSON is you have the, um, the quotes, um, and you have your um, curly braces for string interpolation. Now, if you're using triple quotes, this actually means that your sting, string can contain single quotes. So triple quotes means this is just a regular string, but inside of my regular string, I can just use quotes, and that quote is just taken literally. So the fact in JSON, you have these properties that are delimited by these quotes, so now you can have them. Maybe sometimes, for some reason, inside of your string, you need double quotes. Double quotes will also work, because your string is delimited by triple quotes. So triple quotes is your minimum. Now, if you want to have triple quotes, you have a problem. Because now C-sharp thinks you're trying to do a new string or end the current string. Very easy. It doesn't really matter how many quotes you want inside of your string. Just put one more outside of your string. <laughs> so now you can have triple quotes. You want to have 16 quotes, put 17 in, in the front and at the end. It's basically the same for string inter interpolation. If, you're, if you want to use curly braces like in JSON, you need to add double dollar sign in the start to tell C Sharp, I'm going to use curly braces, and you need to take them literally. It's the same story. So now you need to have double curly brace to actually specify that you're doing string interpolation. For some reason you want to do double, then you need to add another dollar sign. If you want to do 16, you need to add 17 dollar signs. It can become interesting, but it gives you as a developer the flexibility to do whatever you want, basically. So this is your um, raw literal string. So you can put whatever in your string raw. You don't need to have the, um, the backslash. Um, you can just type whatever you want, but of course you need to have uh, enough quotes and enough dollar signs. And then finally, the last one that actually works today um, is the UTF string literals. Um, so basically, when you do strings in, in C Sharp and in .NET in general, a string is a, is a resource-heavy um, type. Uh, also, when you're going to copy strings all over the place, copying strings in memory takes some time because you have objects on the heap memory and you need to copy them. You need to allocate a lot of memory to do that. So in, in very uh, performance, uh, in, in, in cases where performance is very important, um, we have a new type called um, read-only span of bytes, where you can basically have a pointer to a piece of memory. So if you want to copy the pointer around, it's less expensive than copying the entire string all over the place. So a read-only span of byte can actually be compatible with a UTF-8-based uh, string, uh, because Basically, in UTF-8, every uh, character in your string is a byte. So this array of bytes can represent a string, and if you want to use it in that way, before version 11 of C-sharp, you needed to basically get to all of the binary values for each character uh, in your UTF-8 string, which is uh, a little bit uh, hard to do. Or, you, of course, you can also use encoding, um, where you can get bytes for your specific string, but then again, you're allocating um, extra resources, extra memory to actually do that um, thing. So now in C-sharp 11, you can just have a string like you use today, and then just put the U8 for UTF-8 in the end, and this will tell the compiler to convert that into um, the byte values you, you see on top. So for a developer, this is very readable. I can just see this is a string, but that string will be translated into that um, read-only span of bytes, which will then be much easier to use throughout of your application. Also, when you actually um, compile this and look at IELTS Py, for example, so let's very quickly do that. So IELTS Py is that tool that can decompile your source code back into C-sharp. It's 
already here. You can now see that indeed the compiler itself will translate that string into the actual bytes it represents. Um, so it doesn't happen at runtime, it happens at compile time. And this is why this is a new feature uh, in C-sharp and not in .NET. And again, it makes it uh, much more readable uh, to us. It only works this way for now. Um, you also have the pattern matching where you can do the switch and then say, okay, um, I want to switch depending on a string that works today. You could also do it on a read-only span, but it, again, it doesn't uh, work yet. The team is still working on that feature. Um, so it will become available where you can have an input, which is a read-only span, and then you can do pattern matching on that. Okay, if it's this string, if it's this string, if it's this string, and then it, uh, it will actually uh, work. So this was the um, C-sharp features already. There's more features coming because um, .NET uh, 7 and C-Sharp 11, they will, they will be available for us, released in November, the end of this year. Um, so we still have some time to, to add some more of these uh, features, but the ones that I've shown you are available today. And there's actually maybe one more that you, um, that you've that you saw. Um, it's when you have a method. And then a variable of, of type, let's say string, a parameter I mean, not a variable. They added something like this, bang, bang. At the end of your variable name or param per parameter name, um, that actually adds some, some code for us, or at least the compiler adds some code for us to do a null check on that value. It will do a null check and it will throw an argument null exception for us so that we don't have to do it ourselves. Um, the team has actually has actually cancelled this new feature. It was available in uh, a couple of previews uh, before this one, but they removed it because they had some um, heavy discussions on that topic, so they, they moved it up to uh, a later version of C-sharp. So if you already were excited about this feature, um, you can go ahead and, and, and do some crying because it will not be there. All right. So. Those were the new C-sharp features, so let's try to do some um, .NET features. First, um, Scott told us about that um, upgrade assistant that we have if you want to upgrade your .NET framework applications into .NET. Uh, so I told you um, .NET 7 is the upcoming version, .NET 6 is the current version, and every year in November or around November, we will have that new major release of .NET. So the upgrade assistant will help you to convert your framework applications to the current .NET. Today it's .NET 6, but in .NET 7 they will have worked uh, a, lot about, uh, a lot on that upgrade assistant and they will actually help you to upgrade from framework to uh, the current um, .NET version at that time. So I did some examples here. So basically I can, I can do uh, one live, but actually I have to do it on a virtual machine. Because if you have too many Visual Studios installed, it just fails. <laughs> So this one has a, is a clean virtual machine that only has Visual Studio 2022. Um, and if I add a framework project, like for example, a WinForms. Thank you. I'm an old school developer. If I need to create something very quickly, I always go to WinForms. I love you too, man. But, but, indeed, if you have WinForms, this is a, a framework WinForm. Remember framework where you can't double-click the project file to make changes to it? You need to right-click, unload your project file, and then right-click again to edit. Uh, those good old times. So, if you want to upgrade something like this to um, .NET 6, for example, because that's the current one, um, you can do that from the command line. You just cd into that uh, Windows Forms apps uh, folder, and you can use the upgrade assistant to first analyze your project. And when you analyze it, it will tell you what changes need to be do need to be done to actually. Um, upgrade it to .NET. It will show you steps. I need to remove these NuGet packages. I need to add these new NuGet packages. I need to change the SDK from the old SDK to the new SDK. I need to change namespaces if necessary, and I even need to change uh, code. It creates a serif file, and this serif file can be opened 
uh, on the internet, and it will show you that that list. Uh, if you if you're happy with that, um, you can actually ask the assistant to do the upgrade for you, and then becomes and then um, you get a long list of questions. The first question will be: Do you want to have a backup of your older solution or project? Please say yes. So basically, you see a, a whole list of all the steps that it's going to take. Eh? Back up your project, convert your project file to the new SDK-style project for .NET, then clean up all of your NuGet packages, update your uh, target framework monikers, update your NuGet packages, and so on. So this is a, a long story. You just read everything, um, go to the next step, and so on. I'm not going to do it right now, because it will take about five, six minutes um, to do this WinForms. But I tried it beforehand for you. Um, and it's inside of this folder, Upgrade Assistant. So I basically tried for win uh, a console application. Works like a charm, because a console application is not very hard. Um, but if you're using pieces of the .NET framework BCL that are not available in uh, the .NET BCL, or that have a different um, class or a different method that do the same thing, the Upgrade Assistant will try to do that for you. Um, but of course, if it, can't, if it can't do it, because there is no alternative, for example, it will tell you, you will have a compile error, and then you need to, to make those changes manually. Um, but in this case, for a simple console application, it worked without a problem. For WinForms, it also worked without a problem. And I tried it for ASP.NET MVC, and it worked for almost everything, except for in ASP.NET MVC for framework, you have this bundle uh, stuff where you bundle your JavaScript files and you bundle and minify your uh, CSS. Um, this is not available anymore in, in .NET Core, so you need to do that manually yourself by using an alternative. It's not part of .NET, so you, you'll need to do, uh, use something else um, to do that for you. Um, but everything related to .NET will be um, upgraded for you automatically which is nice. So I always have the new one, and then the backup one is the, the previous uh, framework version where I basically started. So that's the Upgrade Assistant. I also use that for MAUI, uh, to go from Xamarin into MAUI, and it also works. The next thing that uh, also Scott talked about is MAUI, so I'm not going to go in, into uh, too much detail, but basically MAUI is now the, 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 the next Xamarin. It's a more modern version of Xamarin, so, so Xamarin will, will cease to exist, basically. Um, I think the latest release of, of Xamarin, the latest official release of Xamarin, was somewhere at the end of last year, I think November or December, and they, promise, they promised us, or at least Microsoft promised us, two years of support, um, which means that by the end of next year there will be no more support for Xamarin, and you all need to migrate to MAUI. You can use the Upgrade Assistant to help you with that, or just start from scratch um, in MAUI. Scott also told you that there's two types of MAUI. There's the officially supported m just MAUI, where you can create your user interface applications for all the platforms you need, for the mobile platforms, for Windows, for Mac Catalyst, uh, and there will be more coming uh, in the future. For example, Samsung Tizen um, is supported, or Tizen, I have no idea how to pronounce that. Um, it will be supported from .NET 7 onwards. Um, and when you basically op open something like this, uh, a MAUI project, um, it's the same as all of your .NET SDK style projects. So it's, it's, it's all the same concept. But here you have a list of your target frameworks that says, I'm going to support Android, I'm going to support iOS, and I'm going to support Mac Catalyst. And then additionally, I will also support Windows. So you can run a Blazor application just write it once and run it on those multiple uh, platforms uh, without any issue. I, I'm actually very excited about this because I'm a, an old school .NET developer again, so I, I like to do everything in .NET. JavaScript gives me the creeps, um, but that's my problem. Don't worry about that. Um, so I, I really like, uh, like MAUI. The only thing that I'm not really happy about is the tooling support. Uh, for now, Visual Studio is still a little bit unstable using MAUI. Um, but I hope it will be better when it's released finally, because it's still in release candidate uh, for now. Then there's the second MAUI, which is a combination of MAUI and Blazor, where you, where you basically have a single uh, window, a page, and that page in XAML 
which is MAUI, it's always in XAML, um, ha just has a Blazor web view. So you have a web view inside of your uh, page, and inside of that web view, you can put your Blazor application. Uh, so if you already have your single page application in Blazor, you can very easily put it into an Android app by, ju by just adding one MAUI page and put your Blazor app inside of that. So very, very easy. And then it runs on Windows and on Android and all the other ones. Google, next one. Um, if for some reason you really like to work with these um, tape archive files, the, the TAR uh, file system, now it's part of the base class library. So the .NET base class library in .NET 7 now has a namespace system.formats.tar um, for all your tape archive wishes. Um, very simple API, you have the tar file static uh, methods like create from a directory, where you have a directory with uh, subdirectories, you just put everything in a tar file, this is your source, this is your destination, and then I can't remember what this is. Include your base directory, yes or no. So, nope. Um, you can do it in the, the other way around, extract a tar file into a directory, and then you can do all kinds of combinations. You can, you, you can work with streams, like put it into a memory stream, send a memory stream over the network, um, whatever you want. But now you, we have, finally, support for tar files. Um, you can also do something like this, where you can uh, open a tar file for reading, and then you can get all of the entries one by one and list them in the console, for example, or, or do whatever you want um, with them. So, Again, very simple new thing. Um, this one is a little bit uh, cooler. GRPC JSON transcoding. Who did GRPC before? A couple of you. So GRPC um, is, a, is a new technology that .NET embraced um, where we can have uh, remote procedure calls that are not REST APIs, they are remote procedure calls like we did in the past with WCF, basically. But WCF is not a part of uh, .NET anymore. It was the old .NET framework. Um, so basically, Microsoft sees gRPC as the new thing for WCF. Now, in gRPC, you basically create a web service that has these remote procedures, and they are defined into, inside of this protobuf file. And that protobuf file is just like the, the, the WSDL we had from, uh, from WCF, where you just describe what your contract will look like. You have a service, that service has a procedure, say hello, which will take a request object and it returns a reply object. And the cool thing about gRPC is that it's binary. It uses a binary communication protocol where your request and your reply objects are basically uh, streams of bytes instead of um, JSON or XML or whatever, which means it's smaller in size, it will be more performant if you want to do service-to-service -service communication. Um, of course, because it's binary, it's, it's hard to debug, and you can't do it from your browser. So you can't use your browser to check your gRPC endpoints because your browser has no support for the protocol gRPC is using. Uh, so if you are that lazy developer like me that just wants to open the browser to check all the endpoints, that doesn't work. Now, from that .NET 7 onward, we have that additional support for gRPC to add um, JSON-based endpoints for us. So before, in uh, .NET 6, this was what gRPC looked like. In .NET 7, optionally, you can add the HTTP option where you can have an endpoint for your gRPC um, procedure. So when I run this application, that now I can, I can run it from my browser to test it. If you run a gRPC application by default, it will um, show you the following message. Communication with gRPC endpoints must be made through a gRPC client to learn how to create a client, blah, 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 blah. So you can't do it from the browser. But again, with the, the JSON um, transcoding, you can now do that v1 greeter. It's already here because I practiced. Hello, future tech. So now that's the same, the exact same endpoint. You only need to, to write your code once. And if you have a client that wants to talk gRPC with your um, service, it will work. But if you have another client that wants to talk HTTP, um, REST-based APIs, and JSON, that will also work. And you as a developer don't have to write that code um, yourself. So you have the option here to just add this option. Um, and then automatically, it will be implemented for you. Next, 
Since a couple of versions of .NET ago, we have support for source generation. So source generation means that the C# -sharp compiler will generate source for us. Why? Because in some cases, generating source can be more performant. A lot of different um, APIs in .NET use reflection, and reflection is checking at runtime what the objects look like and do something with that. And that can be slow because you need to do, you need to do this based on metadata at runtime, which can be hard to do. Um, and regular expressions are just the same thing. Um, so we can use source generation, which means that if we are doing um, regular expressions, so in this case, for example, I have a regular expression that says A, B, C or D, E, F. Uh, and we, we are going to look if a specific text matches this regular expression. This is the way we, we would do it in .NET uh, 6 and, and lower, for example. The problem is that every time you're using the, the regex, uh, every time at runtime, some um, reflection will be used to actually make that work. Now with source generation, you can actually do something like this. You can make a, a, a regex um, like this. You need to make it partial. And you just add an attribute that says this is a reg regex generator that has the expression A, B, C, or D, E, F. Uh, and now the C Sharp compiler will generate source code for you based on your regular expression so that at runtime that code is available. It can be compiled natively if you want, so it will be much more performant. Uh, and the cool thing about this uh, code generation is that if you open your dependencies and analyzers and you look at your regular expression generator, you will actually see your .g.cs, which is your generated c -sharp code, because your compiler continuously runs in Visual Studio. It has created that file for us, and inside this file is all of the generated code that will make that regex more performant. And I did a, a benchmarking on that, which should be this one. And you can see that the top one, the regex code generator, so the first one, first entry, this one is with code generation. And for the test that I did, it took about 50 nanoseconds. And then if you just use the static regular expression over and over and over again, it will take 100 nanoseconds. So the source generated version is actually twice as fast. So if you are using regular expressions very often, um, then you will get a 100% a, a increase in performance there. There's multiple things that, that um, this is actually something from .NET 6, not really .NET 7, but I just added, I've, I have just added it as an, uh, an example. You have the same with serialization and deserialization. So if you're using system.text.json serialize and deserialize, um, it also uses reflection to check the properties uh, on your objects, on your classes, but also in your JSON, uh, which takes some time. And you can now also use uh, data, um, sorry, source generation for that. So if you basically create a partial class data point context for my data point object that I created myself, and I'm going to serialize and deserialize these, then I'm going to, then I can specify this as an uh, optional parameter for my serialize and deserialize method. So all of the serialization and deserialization logic for this specific objects are inside of this static. Um, uh, property. Uh, and now your serialization and deserialization can be, uh, again, more performant thanks to source genera generation. And it's the same thing. You can see the analyzers, the JSON source generator, and this one will contain all of your generated source based on your objects. Um, a couple of very small additions before I wrap this up. Some uh, JSON additions. Um, if you're using the HTTP client, you have extension methods to do serialization and deserialization of JSON with uh, gets and posts and puts, um, but there was no patch available. So from .NET 7 onwards, you will also have the patch as JSON async uh, available. This one is not available in .NET 6 and lower, so this one is new. Um, and then when serializing or deserializing, you have a, max, a maximum depth um, which is hard coded and which is 64. So if you have like a, a, a cyclic um, dependencies in your properties, um, your, your serializer will go up until a depth of 64 and then it will throw an exception. Um, 
Now they have basically made that property public, so you can change that. If for some reason you want to uh, only have a maximum depth of four, in this case, you will get the exception already at four. Um, so if you want to make that check much earlier than 64. So these are, again, a couple of very small um, additions. There's also something new for caching. So the iMemory cache that you can use to do uh, in-memory in caching also has something that is called st track, st 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 blah, track st statistics. Why is that so hard to pronounce? Statistics. So it has some statistics that you can use um, so that you can see what your memory cache is actually doing. So if you put that to true when you're adding the memory cache to your dependency injection container, um, you can actually call a method called get current statistics on your cache. And then you can do things like what is the current entry count? How many items do I have cached? What is the total hits and total misses? So how, how, how many times did I hit my cache and how many times did I miss my cache? Um, so if you want to, to, to be able to, to look at those statistics, uh, you can log them and you can learn from them. There's also the current estimate size of your cache, but this is something that you really need to... Um, it's not size in bytes specifically, it's something that you can um, control yourself. Basically, you tell your memory cache what the size limit is, and uh, the unit is something abstract. So it's not bytes, it's something that, it can be entries, for example, 100 entries, and after 100 entries, nothing can be added to the cache, so I need to remove some things, for example, but it can be whatever you want. Um, so you as a developer need to make that decision what your unit is. Why? Because when you add something to the cache, so when you do the set method on your uh, cache, you ne also need to specify that size. So for example, if you're doing strings, in this case, I can just do the length of the string, and then it's, it's about, um, the number of bytes, but you can also do one always, like hard-coded one, uh, which means that every entry in your cache has size one. Um, this is something you, you as a developer need to specify, uh, but then you can actually get that current estimated size and then you know how many objects or how many roughly bytes are in your cache. So something you can use to um, debug or optimize your applications to see if your cache is working as expected. Um, next thing, microseconds and na nanoseconds. So there are some new properties for multiple objects, like for example, the um, time span and time only and daytime. They had support for like, things like year, month, days, hours, minutes, seconds, uh, milliseconds and ticks, where a tick is 100 um, nanoseconds. Now we also have nanoseconds and microseconds. Um, so you can use that. If you do uh, stopwatches, for example, you can get your time in um, milliseconds, microseconds, and nanoseconds. But you can also create new time spans or time onlys using microseconds. So in this case, it's zero days, zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds, zero milliseconds, but one microsecond. You can't specify the in the constructor the, the nanoseconds, but you can set the nanosecond property. Not the total nanoseconds, but the nanosecond properties. So if you really want to have that fine-grained uh, timing, you can actually now do that. And then finally, I was actually able to do all of them, very nice, is something that I think is very cool, um, which is the generic math. So we have a, a bunch of new um, things and changes in the base class library. Um, that are inside of the system.numerics namespace. For example, I want to calculate the factorial uh, of the faculteit in the Netherlands, um, where for an input value you want to calculate the factorial, but there are so many kinds of types in C Sharp that we can use for numbers. Huh? There is bytes, there is integers, there's unsigned integers, there's longs, there's unsigned longs, there's floats, there's doubles, and there's decimals. Now, if I want to create this method in .NET 6, C Sharp 10, I need to create all of the overloads and I need to implement it multiple times for each of these types, which is, pff, I don't like to do that as a developer. So finally, in .NET 7 and, um, and also C Sharp 11, we have the iNumber interface. And the iNumber interface tells us this is a type that implements for I no from iNumber, so it implements whatever a number can do. 
Um, so if you look at I number, you can see that it's, it self implements from a bunch of interfaces like I comparable, I equatable, I formatable, I blah, 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 blah. But it also has I addition operators. So a number can be added to another number. So if you look at the I additions operators, interface, you can see that it specifies the plus operator, which means that a number can be added to another number. And it, it, the list goes on for quite some time. I'm not going to show you all of the interfaces, but there's the I comparison uh, operators, the decrement operator, so you can do minus minus, division operators, modulus operators, and so on. So this actually means that you can have a, gen a generic type that is a number. So now I can only um, implement the calculate factorial method once, and I can specify a number, and all of the default types in .NET now implement from I number. So they, the, the, the team at .NET made all of those changes in the base class library, so now I can actually do generic math. Of course, when you do calculate factorial, you have st things like uh, if the value is 0 or 1, um, then you just return 1. If the value is 2, you just return 2. In, in all the other cases, you can, you can do it uh, like take the value, multiply it by the same value minus one. But you can't do stuff like zero, because zero is an integer. And now we, we need to have that generic number. So there's also on this interface, T number, there's also um, a static property specifying zero and one, because every number has a zero and has a one. And in this case, I needed to check if my value equals two, Two does not exist in this generic type, so you just do one plus one, which is also two. But again, this is a very cool new feature um, where you can do mathematics and generics, uh, finally, finally. And yeah, with that, I reached the end of all of the things that I wanted to show you that are new in .NET 7 and C Sharp 11. There's still a couple of months, um, so a lot of stuff will be added to this. Um, so if you want to learn about that, just look at the, the Microsoft blog online for .NET and C Sharp, and they will post a very nice uh, overview for you um, with every new preview that we will have. So are there any more questions? Yes. That's a very good question. So your question was the, the, the regex source generator. Uh, why, why, isn't, why isn't it a default? Um, I don't really know the answer, but basically I think that the team doesn't want to create too many things that are different from before. So they just want to make sure that it's opt-in instead of opt-out. Um, because yeah, source, generator, source generation also takes some time while compilation. It needs, it needs some stuff with that. So I, I think that's the reason. But actually, it's a good question. I don't really need uh, know the answer uh, yeah. about that. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe indeed. Uh, yeah, in the past we also had source generation in .NET, but then we we used uh, a different approach. Um, source generation today is actually a, a part of your compiler uh, itself, and it will first do all of your source generation, and then it will compile all of your the source generated files and your source. Um, together, so there's now multiple steps uh, that your compiler takes, so it's, it, it works a little bit different than before. Um, but indeed, good question, why isn't it by default? Sorry. Yes? Yeah, also about the Regex class, I think it currently already has a parameter for pre-compilation. Yeah, there's flags. So what is the difference with the... Again, I can't answer that question. Um, so yeah, your question was, there's already a, a parameter, an optional parameter that you can provide to do, to, to do like a source generation. Um, so no, yeah, pre-compilation, pre yeah. Well, basically there's still a, uh, there's probably still a difference um, because you can at runtime compile things. Uh, at runtime you can, you can compile things and then inject them in, into your running application. But with the source generator, you really compile it at the moment you're compiling your source. And especially for .NET 5, 6, and 7, um, Microsoft is doing things like uh, ahead of time native compilation and stuff like that, where you can compile your .NET application into native code for a specific platform. So it will not be platform independent, it will be compiled natively for a specific platform. And in that case, um, the solution you're suggesting will probably not work because 
in some, not in all, but in some platforms like iOS, for example, you can't do that dynamic compilation during runtime. Um, so that's probably the reason. Any more questions? Nope. All right, then uh, I, I would say enjoy the rest of uh, Future Tech, and uh, I'll see you around. I will be uh, here until this evening. Thank you.